Hi. Um, so hopefully this is streaming right now. This is um, a YouTube live that I'm doing um, while simultaneously recording the content for an online course. Um, on my website, phobiaguru.com, I have a downloadable course, which means that in seven days you can absolutely eliminate your phobia. Um, that course includes videos, it includes um, seven different audio downloads that involve things like hypnosis and NLP and things like that. But currently what I'm doing right now is uh, recording the content for a course so you can actually test your knowledge and learn exactly what's happening. So this YouTube Live is going to be a little bit weird um, from the perspective of you watching this because it's going to have lots of stops and starts because essentially over the next half an hour to hour I'm going to be recording um, basically the components for different elements of an online course. Um, everything from what a phobia is to how to measure the uh, intensity of a phobia, lots of different things. So don't be surprised if um, I talk for a bit and then pause for 30 seconds um, and then record another bit. So um, maybe a bit strange for you uh, watching it, um, but equally, what you will learn from this video is without having to pay for the course, you'll see all of the course content. And actually it's kind of a, uh, uh, almost like a fly on the wall. You're seeing what actually goes on behind the scenes um, for me to uh, record the video content for an online course um, without having to pay for it. So this is um, uh, essentially the, the overall goal, uh, create the content for an online course. Um, the seven day phobia removal system has this course plus all the other bits as well. Um, if you are interested in that, um, have a look on my website, which is phobiaguru.com. And just by going on that website and putting in your email, you can see day one of that seven day course, which is a, um, an hour video about the psychology of fears and phobias. And you'll just get that absolutely free of charge. So well worth doing that if you are interested in the uh, topic of phobias and why we have fears, why we have phobias, uh, particularly ones that feel silly or irrational. So uh, we're gonna start off with, um, okay. So I'm just gonna go, I've got some bullet points here and I'm gonna go through um, them one by one. So the, the, the <clears throat> right, let's, uh, let's get myself into the frame of mind of someone actually looking at this um, in, in isolation for different components. So this section is going to be, so what is a phobia? A phobia is an intense feeling of fear or anxiety as a direct result of a stimulus. There are two main types of fear. You have a simple fear, simple phobia, and a simple phobia is essentially that the stimulus triggers an immediate emotional response of a certain intensity of anxiety that then feels pretty horrible. That's a simple phobia. Examples of simple phobias are things like um, a fear of, let's say, buttons, or a fear of, in many cases, animals such as a butterfly or a spider, you see the stimulus and then you're already feeling that thing. And the clues to simple phobias are that sometimes you can feel the emotional reaction and it wasn't even that thing. So the classic being, uh, if you are an arachnophobe, you might see the top of a tomato, for example, that little green bit. Um, many arachnophobes have had the experience of seeing that on a kitchen floor and then suddenly had this kind of intense feeling of anxiety and then realize that it wasn't a spider anyway. So that's a good example of a simple phobia. A situational phobia or a complex phobia, slightly different. Um, this requires an element of evaluation. So the stimulus is still there, but what happens is an element of evaluation. So for example, it's very difficult to consider a fear of flying or a fear of public speaking as a simple phobia because you don't simply see the plane and then have the reaction. What tends to be the case is that it's the thought process around flying and lots of what if questions that come into the mind as part of that sequence that tend to cause the anxiety. So in a fear of flying, for example, it might be, 
um, what if there's turbulence? What if there's a storm? You know, what if the plane crashes? What if, um, what if I'm in a, in a window seat and I can't get to the aisle? You know, all these kind of questions will tend to what I call go on open loops. Um, a fear of public speaking, for example, it's not that someone sees a microphone and then freaks out. It tends to be the case that someone is invited to speak. So you, someone might, for example, be invited to give a best man speech, for example, and then they think about that future event and then they start thinking of who's going to be there, what am I going to say, and then a lot of what if questions. What if people don't laugh? What if I get my words wrong? What if I forget my words? So there's there's lots of these kind of things and it's the evaluation that really causes the anxiety. So a simple phobia is very much you see it and then you experience the anxiety. A situational phobia is that there is a lot of evaluation that takes place that creates really intense feelings of anxiety and quite often panic as well. So a little gap there before I do the, the next section. One of the key questions that I one of the key questions that I get asked is how do I know the intensity? How severe is my phobia? And the unique thing about phobias are that they are entirely subjective. And when we say subjective, it means that your phobia is only your phobia. It's no one else's. Your experience quite often is going to be unique to you, even if it follows a similar structure. So the key question that myself and other psychologists or people that practice um, CBT, so cognitive behavioral therapy, might ask is that on a scale of one to 10, how intense is your feelings of anxiety based around the, the actual stimulus, based around the, the trigger? And this is known as an, an, a subjective unit of distress. Uh, and that subjective unit of distress is quite often a scale from one to 10, with 10 being absolute panic and extreme anxiety, quite often a panic attack, right down to one, which is gonna be very, very mild levels of anxiety or no anxiety at all. As a framework, what I tend to do is uh, I have three chunks, so I can classify uh, in broad terms the level of intensity of the fear. So essentially, if it's between one and five, then I label that discomfort, okay? Because there is genuine discomfort there. It's not a desirable sensation. It's uncomfortable, okay? Between five and eight, I label this anxiety, okay? These are just my labels. They're not any, you know, um, academic scale or anything like that. It's just a useful framework for me when I'm working with clients. So between one and five, discomfort. Between five and eight, anxiety. Obviously, eight is going to be a more intense anxiety than, let's say, uh, a five or a six. And then beyond eight, I label that panic, okay? Because the difference between anxiety and panic is that when it passes that threshold, it really feels that you are a victim of your um, biochemistry. You know, your unconscious is fully in control there and your blood is being filled with neurotransmitters like adrenaline um, and all these things that kind of freak you out. This is where your heart is beating out of your chest, you know, your rapid breathing. Um, sometimes you might feel like you're frozen, um, lots of things like that. Very, very horrible experience. And the key thing that I do when I'm working with clients is that I want to know the context, okay? Because the thing is, Sometimes a phobic will say, oh, I'm a 10 out of 10 fear, okay? And then what I have to do is ask them questions to see, right, when is it not a 10 out of 10? When is it an eight? Or when is it a nine? Or when is it a five? So for example, I was working with a, uh, a phobia, uh, a rodent phobia. He had specifically a fear of mice and rats. He was fine with hamsters, but mice and rats really didn't like them at all. And I said, right, what's your intensity on a scale of one to 10. And he was like, right, it's, it's a nine or it's a 10 in every case. But then I found out that actually he had had experiences through asking questions about contrast, that if the mouse was further away and if he had more ability to move away from the mouse and you know lots of other variables as well, that actually he could, he could see a mouse and have discomfort, a level four, level five 
um, subjective unit of distress rather than um, a, a really intense like a 9 or a 10. So for him, the key trigger was if it was in close proximity, if there were lots of them, if he couldn't move away, that would be the ultimate level of panic and distress. Whereas if there was one mouse and it was far away and there was some kind of barrier like a cage or a glass or it was in a different room, that would be a lower level of anxiety. That's really useful for me because it gives me the very ingredients that I, I now know matter for that individual. And for many phobics, distance between them and the thing itself, and that could be physical distance or it could also be time, is one of the key variables that either increase or decrease anxiety. So if someone had, let's say, a fear of flying, then if they knew they were going on a flight a year from now, the levels of distress and anxiety are going to be lower. But if they were going on a flight in an hour's time, or if suddenly they had to go on a flight unexpected, the levels of anxiety would be much higher. So how do we me measure anxiety? It's on a scale of 1 to 10, and it's called a subjective unit of distress. Okay. Gonna move back a little bit. That's quite bright. Right, so this section is called understanding the triggers for your phobia. Many people that have a phobia believe that the trigger is a physical thing. So if you have, for example, a fear of dogs or cats or spiders, you may believe that it's actually the thing itself that is the cause of your fear or your anxiety. But you would be mistaken. You know, although that is part of the stimulus, it's not always required. So I'm going to share an example with you. Um, I once worked with a client that had a, an older brother. And when that older brother um, was, um, or when the, when the client was younger, you know, in her, I think she was about eight or nine, something like that. Her older brother used to trap her in a corner and he used to cup his hands like this. And half the time there would be a spider in his hands and the other half it would be empty. Now the older brother thought this was hilarious that she would have such an intense feeling even though there was no spider. But he didn't know what I know and that is that the thing itself is not required for you to have a phobic reaction. For example, if someone has a fear of flying or a fear of public transport, just knowing that they need to take a flight or use public transport to get to a public to a, a particular destination is sufficient for them to feel anxiety. If, for example, um, someone has a fear of um, spiders, for example, then if they believe that there are spiders in a shed or an attic or a garage, um, then the idea of going into that particular location would also create feelings of anxiety, even if there are no spiders there whatsoever. So understanding the trigger is really important because quite often it's not the physical thing itself, but the thoughts about that thing, either about making pictures in your mind of that particular stimulus or thinking about a past event where you experience those things can also cause anxiety, thinking about a future event where you might have to deal with that particular stimulus or thinking about things connected to that thing. Okay, so for example, um, if someone had a, um, a fear of public speaking, for example, then if they know that there are certain meetings that in some cases people get asked to do an impromptu talk, then actually it may not be the public speaking that creates the anxiety, but even thinking about that meeting because there is a possibility of them talking in that meeting. So the thing itself is not the requirement. And the key goal for me when I'm working with clients is I want them to accept a new belief. And that is that it is not about the thing itself, but it is about the thoughts and associations and connections with the thing itself that causes the anxiety, not the original stimulus. And once that belief is, is accepted to be true, then it gives me the ability to um, work with the things that we can control because we can't control how many dogs there are in the world or how many spiders there are in the world. We can control the thoughts and the meaning that we assign to those thoughts, which then give a sense of the control being taken back.
Okay, so this this section is called understanding. Have a look here. Understanding the symptoms of your phobia. One of the key things that I find working with clients is that they believe the issue is their phobia, when in fact, in many cases, it isn't. It may have started out that way, that actually um, perhaps an animal or a particular environment or a situation caused the anxiety. And for many people, the coping mechanism for phobias or severe anxiety is to avoid the stimulus, avoid the trigger of that particular phobia. What tends to happen though, is that the more you avoid that stimulus or that trigger, then the more that anxiety can grow and it can actually spread to other uh, associated areas. The key thing is that it depends on the scale. So if someone has a phobic reaction of low anxiety, so on the scale of one to 10, if it's, if it's five or below, that might be discomfort, which is still um, undesirable. And the kind of symptoms that people tend to experience at a five or lower tends to be that kind of feeling of tightness or rotation um, in, in the pit of their stomach. It might be a slightly elevated um, heart rate. It might be um, recurring thoughts, lots of what if questions and um, constant checking and things like that. That tends to be the symptoms of someone in the category that I call discomfort, okay? Between, let's say, a level five and a level eight, this is the anxiety phase, then you tend to get some different things. You tend to get more muscle tension. You tend to get even more intense um, tightness of kind of muscles. The breathing tends to be a bit more rapid. Um, you get associations like that. The, the heart rate tends to elevate. These are the kind of things that you would get between a level five and an eight. Panic attacks um, which is where it would be, let's say, a level nine or a level 10 on the scale. So the most intense forms of anxiety. These tend to be where your sympathetic nervous system has kicked in. And the sympathetic nervous system is, to use a metaphor, what I consider the red alert of your neurology. So at the point where your unconscious mind feels that you cannot cope with the situation that you're in, it uses the fight or flight response, the sympathetic nervous system, as a last resort. And I want you to think of a bee. Everyone knows that a bee um, basically commits suicide the moment it stings um, a potential threat. So a bee doesn't really want to use uh, its stinging thing. It will do it as a last resort. And I want you to think of panic attacks as almost like the body's last resort at trying to attempt to deal with a perceived threat or issue, okay? So if it feels that it is overwhelmed, it can't cope, then a panic attack can take place. And a panic attack is really rapid breathing. Your body at that point has dumped a lot of these neurotransmitters into your blood. And these are things like um, adrenaline, also known as epinephrine or neuroepinephrine. These are the things that make you hyper-focused. You know, it almost feels like time has slowed down. You tend to breathe really, really fast. You might feel chills. So your blood is going from your uh, extremities to your core organs, like your heart, your lungs, all these kind of things. And if you were being, if you think of your ancestors, if you were being stalked by a predator, like a lion, a tiger, or a saber-toothed tiger, then this reaction might mean the difference between surviving and not surviving. So the symptoms of a panic attack has a useful function, but it can feel really overwhelming. One of the things to look for at the point of a panic attack is that many people focus on breathing in. This is where you get this rapid breathing. They think they're gonna faint or um, die because they simply can't take a breath in. So they're all they're doing really is they're forgetting to breathe out. So one of my tips to managing the more severe forms of anxiety or even panic is to not focus on breathing in, but focus on the out breath. Because if you exhale every bit of breath in your lungs, guess what? Your lungs then have to take a, bre a breath in. So that's my, my tip for you is to focus on breathing out rather than breathing in. And also, once you're in control of your breath, then start taking control of your inner 
dialogue. And typically what happens when people are having panic attacks is that there are recurring thoughts that basically are saying, you can't cope with this, you're going to die, you know, this is a horrible situation. And of course, those thoughts then create this feeling of being at huge vulnerability, huge risk, there's this massive threat that you can't cope with. And of course, the unconscious mind and the mind itself between the hippocampus and the amygdala is going to pump even more of the remaining neurotransmitters in a, uh, a an attempt for you to survive. So that's why, that's what the symptoms are. And that's why you have those symptoms. You're not crazy, you know, and you're not going to die. And one final thing I would say about the really intense feelings of anxiety are that they are always temporary. Okay. Most people, when they're having really severe forms of anxiety, have this idea of permanence, when in fact you know that that's not the case. Because even if you've had really intense feelings of anxiety before, they've only ever been temporary. You've never had a permanent anxiety attack or a permanent panic attack. As distressing as they may have been, they were always temporary. And one of the things I'm going to talk about later is how you can actually manage panic attacks. Resourceful states and how to use them. States is an interesting term that we tend to use as psychologists, emotional states. And some of the emotions that we tend to think of when we think of emotions are things like happiness or worry, frustration or relaxation. And the average person, um, as, as various psychological studies have shown, accesses relatively few numbers of different emotional states. Um, and it's been said that, you know, someone that is always angry or frustrated will find a way to get angry or frustrated in whatever the situation may be. Whereas someone very optimistic, very positive, even if the worst thing in the world is happening, they will find a way to look at it in a way where there is optimism and hope. Okay, so these emotional states, rather than just looking at them as things that happen to you, you can start thinking of emotional states as things that either work for you or work against you. So, for example, if you wanted to complete a project, whatever that project might be, and you're, you were in a state of, um, let's say, uh, your mood was very low, you were feeling tired, lethargic, sluggish, uh, you were easily distracted. And not only that, you were worried about something that you had to do, maybe bills to pay or something like that. In those states, it's likely that you would not accomplish that project to the best of your ability. Likewise, if you had exactly the same project to do, but you were in the state of optimism, positivity, motivation, determination, tenacity, all these kind of things that were really useful for you to get the project done, then even though the project was the same level of difficulty, if you were in unresourceful states, that might be a challenge that takes forever. In the right resourceful states, you might be able to get that same project done relatively quickly. So this is what we mean when we say resourceful states. This is also one of the key contributing factors to phobias being so debilitating. Because the sequence of a phobia is that you have the, uh, the stimulus and then you have the emotional reaction. So if the stimulus, let's say, is a snake and you see a snake and then you're feeling, you know, very, very anxious and you're feeling very scared and you're feeling very distressed, then in that emotional state, you, you wouldn't be in a very well-equipped situation to handle the problem. If, however, you saw a snake, and there are one of my heroes when it comes to um, nature and wildlife was someone that I used to watch on TV growing up, a guy called Steve Irwin, um, big hero of mine. And for him, if he saw a snake, his emotional response would be fascination, enthusiasm, you know, a real uh, interest and eagerness. He would want to get close and see what it's doing. Now, in that emotional state, 
it's impossible for fear to exist. And therefore, the behavior that we tend to be drawn towards is a reflection of the emotional state that we're in or the resources that we're in. The goal when I'm working with clients is to have the same stimulus create a different emotional response to give them choices as to what behavior they will actually do. Um, so that's what we mean when we say emotional states or resourceful states. And one of the ways in which we can actually get someone to utilize an emotional state is a process called anchoring. And one of the uh, downloads that comes with the online course actually will teach you how to create anchors or triggers that you choose to use yourself to create these resourceful states that can help you massively, not just with a phobia, but with any other situation. For example, you might procrastinate, for example. You might constantly put things off. Well, if you're in a different emotional state, then you can literally kind of plow through those things that you need to do like a hot knife through butter, um, but only if you're in the right emotional state. Um, so that's what emotional states are um, and why they're so useful. Hope this is uh, useful for, for any of you guys watching this video so far. So this is just me bit by bit creating a bit of content for the online course. Um, right, so this next one is about metaphors. As a hypnotherapist, I talk in many terms of, um, let me start that again. As a hypnotherapist, I quite often talk in terms of metaphors. And the reason that metaphors are so important is that it takes something and then as humans, we relate that to our own experience. And there's a few metaphors that I consistently use in different contexts. So one of the metaphors, for example, that I will use for the, uh, the sequence of a phobia is a series of dominoes that actually the first domino might be the stimulus and then it creates um, a series of maybe six or seven or eight dominoes. And if the first one clicks down, then they will follow that sequence very, very quickly until someone has accessed that anxious, um, horrible, emotional, distressing state, potentially even panic. So domino, dominoes is quite a useful metaphor to talk about what's actually happening in the brain in terms of the neural pathways that link the stimulus to the emotional response. When it comes to fear, I have different metaphors that I use. And if you think about public culture, society, these metaphors are quite often used consistently in society. So for example, one of the key things that let's say movies will use as a metaphor for fear is a metaphor of a monster or quite often shadows, okay? So these things are, it almost kind of created to represent fear. Um, quite often it's the unknown. If you think about fear in a suspense, then it's the unknown which represents the, the fear. Um, and there are lots of other um, things. You know, some people will have um, a metaphor that fear is a prison, which can be true in many cases. You know, I remember in my late teenage years, early 20s, I had so much anxieties and fear that I had, you know, become a recluse and, and, and I didn't really leave the place where I was living. Um, and even walking towards the door, my, my heart would start beating out of my chest. So in a way I had accidentally, and now I understand what I did, but I had accidentally created my own prison because of my avoidance of anything that caused this discomfort, anxiety, or panic. Um, so a prison could be a metaphor. Monsters can be a metaphor. Shadows can be a metaphor. Now, I quite like shadows as a metaphor because it can be used against you, but it could also be used for you. So for example, if we say that fear are like shadows, well, that's fine, but we also have to then say, what's the opposite of shadows? And the opposite of shadows, uh, and I'm saying this as I'm, I'm looking into uh, bright studio lights here, um, the opposite of shadows is light. Now, you can't really see kind of any shadows here because there's a light in front and there's a, a light behind. So therefore, light means that shadows can't exist. And the metaphor that I use with clients is that 
Um, if fear and anxiety are shadows, then action is like light. And that's really, really important because what I found is that back when I had all these crippling phobias and anxieties and fears, my overall strategy of coping was avoidance, okay? Now, avoidance or hesitation or, you know, inactivity is obviously the opposite of action. And the opposite of light, if I was to switch these lights off, suddenly there would be lots of darkness. Therefore, that's what I experienced as, a, as, as someone you know, about 20 years ago. There was lots more anxiety. And although I started off with just a couple of mild discomfort, that grew and grew and grew because my avoidance was allowing more shadows to enter uh, where it should have been light. When, however, I found myself in a resourceful state and I started taking action and I started finding a resourceful state known as courage and started taking action even though it wasn't pleasant and it was still undesirable and it was uncomfortable, what I found is that the shadows became less and less and less and now I'm, a I'm able to do things that um, you know seem very brave, very confident, but it's because I know how fear works and, and that's why the metaphor of light and shadows is a very useful metaphor when it comes to fear. I also use a metaphor when it comes to hypnosis, okay, because one of the key um, misconceptions that I see people have when it comes to hypnosis is that they are the passive participant in the process and that hypnosis is happening to them rather than with them. So one of the metaphors that I, I use with clients when I talk about hypnosis is that hypnosis is like the stabilizers on a bike. Now, if you remember when you were a child, perhaps you started to ride a bike and probably your first bikes had these stabilizers, the training wheels on there, because if you went straight onto a two wheel bike and you didn't know how to ride a bike, you would probably fall off so many times that you didn't think it was possible. And many of my clients before they work with me have attempted to deal with their problem, their phobia several times and failed so many times that they start to create a belief that it's not gonna change for them, that it's not possible. Therefore, they need support to show themselves, to prove to themselves that an alternative future is possible. And I say to my clients, I say it would be ridiculous if you were, if you saw someone sat on a bike with stabilizers and they complained that the bike wasn't moving, but then they weren't pedaling and they weren't steering. So the metaphor that I use is that if the stabilizers are the support, you know, they are the additional, um, let's say safety net, if you like, for uh, the person driving the bike, then action is them pedaling and steering is them making choices and decisions. And I make it very, very clear when I'm working with clients, I can't do, I can't change your mind, but I can work with you to, to, for you to break through this fear permanently. So that's the importance of metaphors. And you might find that you've got your own metaphors. Um, you know, people will, you, and, and the clues are in the language. Uh, there is always clues in language as to what metaphors people are using when it comes to phobias or anxieties or fears. Once you know that metaphor, you can either change that metaphor or simply replace it with a more useful metaphor. Okay, so the next two bits here are the importance of courage and the importance of fascination. Um, I'm gonna do these again, but this is covered in the, um, in the anchoring um, video that I've already created. Why is courage important? Courage is defined as the willingness to take action, even in spite of fear. There are numerous quotes that talk about feel the fear and do it anyway. You know, courage is being willing to take action even if the fear is there. So it's really, really powerful to kind of think about this state of courage, because if we agree that fear is like shadows and action is like light, then courage, therefore, is the stepping stone to breaking through your fears. The willingness to take action so that you can prove that you can cope then creates a self-fulfilling prophecy where the more action you take and the more you prove that you can cope, then the more that your unconscious mind accepts that you can handle this 
and therefore it doesn't need to create the state of anxiety to either protect you or give you the resources of that adrenaline. It simply doesn't need to do that. Courage is a really, really powerful resource and one of the best ways of accessing that is to think of times that you've been courageous, anchor that state, and then use that emotional state before you're, before you're going to do the very thing um, that you are currently anxious about. And I remember, you know, one of my fears, one of my uh, phobias um, in my early 20s was I had a fear of public speaking. And if I was talking in front of even two or three people, I used to get uh, a red rash uh, across my chest. My um, throat muscles used to kind of close up. I used to swallow excessively. I used to get kind of um, little twitches and, and ticks and things like that. It was a horrible experience. Uh, and then one day I was invited to speak. This is uh, a couple of years after I launched my uh, my first proper business um, to speak at a, a final uh, of an award ceremony at the Savoy Hotel. And, and they said, would you like to speak at our awards dinner? And I said, yes, because I'd learned a few of these techniques at this point. Knowing that by saying yes, that was already taking action. Sometimes the words or the thoughts can be the action before the action, and that creates momentum. So I went from having a crippling fear of speaking in front of two or three people, and now it's a, it's a key part of my, my business, it's a key part of what I am known for. You know, I'm a professional public speaker. Um, so these things can change, but it was only because I had accessed that state of um, courage and had a willingness and then backed that up with action to do the thing to make sure that I had new references to prove. So back then, if I thought about public speaking, all of my memories would have been me failing and me getting anxious and me getting scared and distressed. So that's not a useful thing. To break out of that pattern, I knew that I needed to have an example of me being able to cope, and not only cope, but to do it of my own choosing. I wasn't being coerced into this, I was doing it because I wanted to do it. And that's a crucial component as to what makes courage, courage. It has to come from you. If you're forced into a situation of confronting your fear, that's not courage, that's coercion. Courage has to be a choice that you're making and you're backing that choice up with your own action. That's what courage is. I just have to look away from this light. It's very, very intense. Okay. The importance of fascination. Fascination is also a very powerful, resourceful state. And the key reason why it's so important is because in my experience, a lot of fear is based on ignorance. It is based on false assumptions. It is based on generalizations. And what you tend to find is that if you are really fascinated with the very thing that you've been fearing, and even more so, fascinated with the psychology of fear itself, then that fascination can actually give you access to new ideas, new ways of thinking that give new perspective that actually mean that that thing that you thought of all along wasn't even true. One of the key things that I tend to find is that people that have severe fears state things that are um, quite often myths or misconceptions as if they are absolute facts. And by doing so, that creates a belief and that belief triggers those um, distressing or unuseful resourceful states, quite often debilitating resourceful states like anxiety and distress and avoidance. And therefore, their experience is that of a negative experience. And then that proves that their belief or their fear or their phobia is real. It's what's known as the belief cycle. And the way to break out of that belief cycle is to get really fascinated about the psychology of fear, the psychology of phobias, and also the very thing itself. So for me, for example, I used to be um, terrified of, of heights, for example. Um, even climbing a ladder, I used to you know, have severe anxiety. You know, Quite often I would get very kind of stressed and things like that. And for me, I became fascinated with skydiving, you know, the, the different types of parachutes, the altitude, the planes that they use, uh, the wind conditions and all these kind of things. And that fascination actually meant that I, I became excited, interested in doing this thing, even though I was equally scared of heights, 
I, I was fascinated by this ability to imagine just kind of traveling through the air, um, feeling weightless and, and all these things. But it was the fascination that provided that stepping stone. Um, so fascination is a really useful resource. And when I work with people that have a fear of spiders, you tend to find that most people with a fear of spiders aren't anywhere close to spiders. They tend to be as far away from them as possible. And once we go through hypnosis and NLP techniques to create a change, for the first time ever, they're able to get close to spiders. And when you're close to a spider, you can actually see how unique a creature they are. Um, they are unlike insects. They, they, they are very different creatures. The, the way they move, the, their legs, their functions, um, you know, even the, the abdomen, their ability to spin silk webs, fascinating creatures, even the patterns um, are fascinating. But it requires an ability to be in a resourceful state to find that fascination. And you find when people really are fascinated with whatever their fear is, that can become a very powerful stepping stone for them to take action and realize that a lot of these false assumptions and statements and beliefs were never true, but because they believe them to be true, that's what got in the way of their progress. What is the sympathetic nervous system? The sympathetic nervous system is also known as the fight or flight response. Also known as the fight, flight, or freeze response. It's essentially where your body is trying to respond to an imminent threat or danger. And typically what happens is the amygdala and the hippocampus start producing huge amounts and releasing huge amounts of neurotransmitters like adrenaline, also known as epinephrine or neuroepinephrine. And they're flooding your body with all the kind of things that mean it can cope with a life or death situation. That's really useful if you are indeed in a life or death situation. You tend to temporarily not feel pain. You tend to think rapidly. You tend to have your heart beating um, much faster to pump blood to your core organs so that you can fight off a predator or run away from a predator. And it is very useful if you are dealing with a predator. However, although humans and human minds have evolved over you know, thousands upon thousands of years, society has changed unrecognizably in a fairly short period of time. So we have brains that are hardwired for survival living in a society where there aren't many imminent threats to life or death. In which case, we have these tools inside of our brain that can equip us to deal with what feels like insurmountable, overwhelming stress. Okay. Now, what used to be maybe something like uh, a wolf or a saber-toothed tiger chasing after us that would be useful to create this response, now might be that you have to do a presentation in front of your colleagues or someone has criticized you on social media um, or there might be something that has germs, for example, or vomit or blood or something like that. And that has creating a similar response. And it's not because you're silly and it's not because you're irrational. It's because we have this infrastructure in our brains that has been designed to cope with imminent threat. And we still have that machinery in our brains. It's just not useful for the majority of applications that we find it's being used for. You're not crazy, you're not mad. We just have this hardwired in our brain. So what is anxiety? Anxiety is a label. It is something that we use to describe certain feelings that we have. Now, in the same way that hunger can mean 10 different things to 10 different people, so can anxiety. Anxiety can be someone worrying about a future event. Anxiety could be those feelings in the gut or tension around the neck or the shoulders. Anxiety could be a full-blown panic attack 
or anxiety could be just an unsettled feeling. The key thing is that it is the label used by the individual. It is a unique subjective experience. Key things to know about anxiety. One is that it is always temporary. You have never had permanent anxiety. Therefore, anxiety will come and it will go. And therefore, that's a useful way of thinking about it. Almost like it's it's a butterfly that's visiting you and very soon it will find something else to fly away to. Another metaphor could be waves. And very soon, I'm going to talk about using this metaphor of waves to ride a a wave of anxiety. Um, so the key thing is anxiety is tends to be a combination of physiological sensations, so tightness of muscles, rapid breathing, things like that. It's also what we do to label the thoughts in a particular sequence in our heads. And normally they're interrelated. So if you think about a undesirable future outcome, and that's something you're worrying about, then your body is dealing with that future event as if it's happening in the present. And that's why you feel those horrible feelings quite often in your gut or your chest or around your neck and shoulders or whatever it might be. Anxiety itself is simply the label that we give these feelings and these thoughts. Here's the interesting thing. What you may be labeling anxiety, another person might label those same thoughts those same physical sensations as excitement. There are people right now paying to do things that would give you severe feelings of anxiety. And in many cases, one person's anxiety and stress is another person's fun. So it's really important to know that anxiety is temporary and also it is subjective and equally it is unique to you. And now, you know, for, for myself that has severe anxiety before, quite often I label it in different ways. And the language that I use means that it gets me accessing resourceful states so that I'm willing to ride that wave much more effortlessly and easily, whereas before it would have been debilitating and crippling. How to ride a wave of anxiety, or also how to manage a panic attack. Now, the phrase panic attack is not a useful phrase for two reasons. Panic already has this feeling of complete overwhelm. You know, if you kind of think of the word panic and you were to make an image in your mind of someone else panicking, they are not in control. They are the victim of something happening to them. Now, if I said the word attack, the attack element implies a threat and a victim. Therefore, the combination of panic and attack is a very unhelpful phrase when it comes to people dealing with just severe forms of anxiety. And I would say that panic attack is a metaphor in itself. But if we're using a metaphor anyway, why not choose a better metaphor? Why not choose a metaphor that's actually useful for us? And when I'm working with clients, the metaphor that I tend to use is that anxiety is like a wave. And many people have have had the experience of being at the beach at a seaside and they go into the ocean, perhaps when they're a child, and then a large wave comes. And the interesting thing is, is that if you don't move at all, or if you attempt to run away too late from a wave, then the wave hits you. That becomes a threat. You become the victim of that, and it's going to knock you around. It's going to feel unpleasant, okay? However, when people feel comfortable at the beach and in the sea, what they tend to find is that there are ways to have the the, the wave work with you. So if a wave is coming along, quite often it's good to either swim underneath it or swim into it so you rise with the wave. Now, one of the things that you will get as part of this online course is a very specific download, a short download, which actually equips you, I call it the the emergency um, panic attack um, kit, where basically you've got an audio file. So if you feel like a panic attack is coming along, then actually you listen to this. And the first thing we do is we reframe it. We frame it away from being a panic attack and into this metaphor of it being a wave. And we're also gonna make you reframe the inner dialogue 
quite often when someone's having a panic attack, they'll things like, oh, you know, I'm having a heart attack, you know, I'm going to die, all these kind of things. Now, if you're saying words like that, then of course, your brain is going to perceive that as an imminent threat to your life, in which case it will use its last resort functionality for the sympathetic nervous system, this fight or flight response and pump your body full of adrenaline. And guess what's going to happen if your blood has more adrenaline in it? Your heart is going to be even faster. You're going to breathe more rapidly. And then that's going to be evidence to you that you can't cope even more. And so the cycle continues. So the key thing is thinking about anxiety, particularly extreme anxiety, as just a large wave, then it's going to communicate to you that all waves are temporary. The wave will come and the wave will pass and that you have the resources to cope. You have the resources to cope by shifting your attention away from things that you can't control to things that you can control. And by doing so, you can ride the wave. And if you ride the wave competently, even just once, then you have a reference point that you can ride this wave in the future. And you've probably seen videos of crazy surfers that are kind of riding, you know, 100 foot waves and things like that. They didn't start that way. They built up their confidence of being able to handle situations. Now, what would be a threat and something terrifying for other people, they've managed to tame that wave by being comfortable and knowing the lay of the land. So therefore, the more experience you have of riding these waves, then actually, the more that you're able to take on if you choose to, but equally, the moment that you know that you can handle anxiety and that it's simply a temporary sensation and that actually it can also build your resilience and make you stronger for any future waves in the future, then actually what you tend to find is rather than the waves getting bigger, the waves actually get smaller and it becomes easier and easier to handle anxiety. The power of immersive therapy. We talked about courage and we talked about this feeling of you feel the fear and you do it anywhere. Let me start that again, anywhere, anyway. The power of immersive therapy. We talked about this feeling of courage and the ability to feel the fear and just do it anyway. Well, the key thing is, is that I am a big advocate of facing fears and doing the very thing that you fear, because I think it's the single most effective way to create new belief systems and new feelings that you are actually in control. But I would add a big caveat there. I would say the time to do the thing that you fear is when you are in a resourceful state. And those resources are absolutely crucial. So my goal when I'm working with clients is to change the sequence, those dominoes in a row, so that the trigger is not able to create high levels of anxiety. Therefore, if the individual is in a more resourceful state, then we introduce something known as the convincer strategy. And that is that they do the very thing that they've been frightened of or feeling anxious around, not simply just to do it, but to become evidence. And it's also what I would call the nail in the coffin of your phobia. It's evidence that your fear is gone for good. And that's when immersive therapy is at its most powerful. If someone, for, for example, when I created my brand, uh, Phobia Guru, I had to ask myself whether or not I had any irrational fears left. And the reality is, is that I did. I had this fear of um, stand-up comedy. The idea of going on a stage and telling jokes terrified me. And I thought, well, look, if I'm going to be a expert, a specialist, this phobia guru, then it becomes ironic. It becomes hypocritical if I have any of these irrational fears. So I decided that I absolutely must do this thing that I fear because the fear is an irrational fear. There is no death possible if you do stand up comedy, you know, so it's just this feeling of being evaluated uh, particularly for me, because I used to have a, a fear of public speaking. You know, stand-up comedy is like public speaking times 10. You know, it's just a more intense version of the root of those fears. So for me, if I'd have made that decision and then simply turned up at a open mic comedy club and just did, did five minutes, 
I don't think I would have been in a resourceful state. So for me, I went through a particular structure where I bought some books on stand-up comedy, I wrote some material, I practiced, you know, I spoke to other people that were doing it. Essentially, I prepared I, I, and I used lots of the techniques that I work on with other people on myself. So at the point where I did my first stand-up comedy um, a show, I can't really call it a show, it was five minutes worth of material in front of 100 people in a, in a bar in the East End of London, I felt that although the anxiety was there, that I had prepared and I could cope for that. Immersive therapy is incredibly useful if it's used at the right time. And if it isn't, or if you're being coerced to do that thing, or if you're being tricked to experience this thing that you've um, you've uh, have the anxiety or the phobia around, then actually it could be more it could do more damage than good. Okay, so immersive therapy is indeed doing the thing that you fear, but I would say it's better to do it in stages, and it's better to do it when you're feeling in a really resourceful um, state. Immersive therapy can be done in real life or it can also be done in your imagination. And that's why you see these virtual reality applications coming along. So you get to experience your fear in incremental stages and that's designed to create new neural pathways. Although that's a useful innovation in the field of dealing with phobias, I don't think it's necessary because our imagination is going to be more effective than virtual reality. And also reality is always going to be more real than virtual reality. So virtual reality, I, I don't think is necessary, although it might be useful for some individuals. The key thing is immersive therapy is doing the thing that you fear. It is a great tool, so long as it's used at the right time. What is flooding? Flooding is an extreme form of immersive therapy where essentially someone does a high level version of their fear. And I'm a big fan of this. You know, I used to have a fear of heights, just climbing up a ladder on the side of a building. I would get these kind of feelings of anxiety right in my chest and in my stomach, uh, very unpleasant feelings. Um, but that's why I chose when I got myself in a resourceful state to do skydiving. And the reason why I chose to do skydiving is that I wanted to do something so extreme that whenever I thought about these kind of day-to-day -day more realistic challenges that involved heights, I would have a frame of reference to then give context to that particular thing. I'm a big fan of walking my own talk, but equally enabling other people to prove that their fear is gone. So for example, quite often I work with people with a fear of heights, and I asked them to book tickets to the view from the Shard, the, the, one of the tallest buildings in Europe, so that they've got evidence that they can do it. Um, my clinic's in Harley Street, uh, on the corner of Harley Street and Cavendish Square, and I've worked with people with a fear of birds, and then immediately after the session, we take them outside um, and, we, and we see pigeons and things like that. It's really, really important to test that the treatment has been effective um, flooding is where you go to the extreme version of that. Um, so, you know, there's lots of different ways in which you can do it. The psychology behind flooding is that your body can only produce adrenaline for about 20 or 25 minutes, at which point it runs out. So the goal is that if you do that thing that you've been uh, terrified about for long enough, then your body will simply run out of the ability to cause anxiety and then if you have the experience of not being anxious in the same environment that was making you anxious before, then it creates new frames of reference, new feelings that you can cope because you are coping. And the goal is to do it long enough to break through that fear. One of the key things that we do when I host my spider workshops is at the end, we give people a tarantula to hold. Now, let me be very upfront here. Holding tarantulas is not a useful thing to do in day-to-day -day life. The reason why it's useful in this context is because if someone has had the experience of holding a huge tarantula, then when they see a small house spider in their own kitchen or front room, then in contrast to that tarantula, it feels small and it feels manageable. That's where flooding takes place. The final example I'm going to give of flooding is when I worked with a guy who had a severe fear of traveling on public transport, particularly the London Underground. 
uh, to the extent that just being on there for one, two, three stops would cause him immense levels of anxiety. Now, I worked with him to change his thoughts, his inner dialogue, and the patterns that led to that anxiety. But then we needed a form of extreme immersive therapy to make sure that his fear would be gone for good. And I asked him about uh, particular charitable causes that he was interested in. And we found that there was a cause that he was very passionate about. This taps into a higher value system than himself. People will do more for other people than they will do for themselves. So the key thing about this is that he was willing, and it was his choice, albeit prompted and guided by me, to do a charity um, event where he would spend 12 hours on the London Underground on all different tube lines in order to raise money for charity. Now, I knew that his adrenaline would run out after about half an hour and that he would be spending about 11 and a half hours on the London Underground system where he would be impossible for him to feel anxious for that whole period of time. Now, I preempted this. I primed him by saying, success for you currently, because at this point in time, you've only ever felt severe anxiety while being on the underground. I said, here's, wh here's what success looks like. Success is when you are bored on the London Underground and you realize that you've got another eight or nine hours of being on the London Underground. Because if you can feel boredom at a time previously that you were feeling panic, then you no longer have a fear. You no longer have a phobia. Now, of course, this was a post-hypnotic suggestion, but it was also a true statement. How can you have a phobia if you are bored in the situation where um, you know, you've, you've had this phobic reaction? The two things can't be true. So that's why it was such a, an important goal for him to do. Now, it required courage for him to set that challenge, to go public, to raise money for this cause. But once he'd actually done that, it was impossible for him to go back and feel panic and anxiety. If you spent 12 hours on the London Underground, then just going on a, tubes, uh, a tube line for two, three, four stops feels very manageable in contrast. That's the power of flooding and extreme immersive therapy. But ideally you would do that alongside the guidance of someone that knows what they're talking about because I've also worked with patients and, and clients that have been goaded and pushed into immersive therapy when they weren't ready. And actually that has made their fear even worse because instead of having a reference that they can cope, they have a reference that they can't help, they, that they can't cope even when there is a professional around. And that actually makes the fear more debilitating and it's been counterproductive to what it was intended to do. So immersive therapy is great. Flooding can be even more powerful, but make sure you use it in the right context and with the right support. So why are belief systems so important when it comes to phobias? The key thing is that it's all about the belief cycle. Now the belief cycle says that depending on what you believe is gonna be a gateway towards emotional states. So for example, if you believe that all dogs are dangerous, dogs are killers, um, then essentially, if you were to think or see a dog you're going to be feeling very anxious, very wary in that situation. You're going to be constantly checking for dogs um, just because of that belief system that they are dangerous. Now, the key thing is that belief system, as many belief systems, is a generalization. If we labeled that belief, some dogs are dangerous, then it becomes a useful belief system. Because as a dog owner, I know that some dogs are lovely and friendly and other dogs really are dangerous. But there's certain things to look out for to determine if a dog is dangerous or aggressive or if it's friendly. If, however, the belief system is a generalization that all dogs are dangerous, then you're going to be accessing emotional states, which makes you feel that you are need to be cautious or wary or on guard or defensive. OK, now with those emotional states, that will certainly influence your behavior and also what you pay attention to. 
you will pay more attention to stories about dog attacks where perhaps a dog has killed a baby, for example, or, or a small child. You'll be very sensitized to those. And that's what's known as selective bias. Same thing happens when certain people see horoscopes or fortune tellers. They hone in on the things that they then prove to be the case and applicable to their life and then ignore everything else. So even if there's lots of stories about how lovely dogs are and these hero dogs, they will ignore that and just pay attention to the dogs that are dangerous, therefore fueling and perpetuating this belief system. However, once this behavior is there of constantly avoiding dogs, constantly having this kind of reaction of wariness and hesitation, then, of course, there is these feelings of genuine anxiety whenever dogs are around, which then proves the belief that dogs are dangerous because the psychology is that if I feel anxious around dogs, it's because they are genuinely a threat or a risk, and that's why the anxiety is real. It's the dogs. I can't stand the dogs. Dogs are horrible. So the belief cycle continues. However, if we replace that with a different belief system, then the cycle can run in a different way. And if that is that dogs are um, friendly animals, for example, if you see dogs are friendly animals and then you suddenly are looking for things that prove that they are friendly, such as, you know, helping, um, let's say, blind people, for example, or playing with children, and maybe there's um, dogs that are used in cancer wards to, you know, um, create an emotional bond with, with sick children. Suddenly, the belief means that you're looking for different references, and those different references are going to mean that you feel different things around dogs. And therefore, because you're willing to spend time on dogs, and if you stroke them and they enjoy it and they like playing games, for example, then suddenly those different experiences then prove that your new belief is true. That's the power of the belief cycle. Now, what's really important is that the human mind does not like to change beliefs. That's why hypnosis and neurolinguistic programming can be very powerful to that, because my speciality is getting people to believe things that are useful for them and to disregard beliefs that are no longer useful for them. Because as humans, we are constantly upgrading and changing our belief systems. That's why it's really, really important to say, well, look, is this belief still useful? Because if someone has spent 20 or 30 years believing something and the consequence of that belief is that they feel anxious and distressed and have panic attacks, then we have to ask ourselves, is that a useful belief system to have or not? And if it isn't a useful belief system, doesn't it make sense to change it and try on a different belief system for size? It would be ridiculous if you wore the same clothes every day for 20 years. That would be ridiculous. But... Wouldn't it be useful to change those clothes and then see which clothes fit you best? And that's the same with belief systems. As someone doing what I do, I don't really care whether or not beliefs are true or not. What I do care about is whether they are useful or not. And if the belief is useful, then it's worth keeping. And if it's not useful and it's debilitating, then you have to ask yourself, what do you have to gain by keeping that belief system? And sometimes in psychology and hypnosis, there is a condition known as secondary gain. Secondary gain is that actually sometimes people do benefit by having certain belief systems. That might be the environment or the uh, culture or the peer group that they're based in. You know, sometimes people are rewarded for believing negative things, for example, um, or having certain political affiliations or links. So to simply change belief systems um, may not be rewarded within the immediate environment that you're in. The key thing is, for me, I'm very interested in how we can have ecological outcomes where the belief can change without any unwanted, undesirable outcomes. Um, change a belief and you can change someone's entire life. I remember working with a, a weight loss client once, and I, I could tell, um, based on her behavior and the cycle of what she labeled self-sabotage, that she had a core belief that if that core belief didn't change, then actually nothing I worked with her would be long-lasting. And that is that she had two core beliefs. One is that she was not good enough. She genuinely believed that she was worthless and not of value. Second belief 
is that she always fails. Okay, anything she tries that's important, she always messes it up. Now, the key thing is, both of those become self-fulfilling prophecies. If anything important you fail, and you genuinely believe that, well, the moment that you start succeeding, it creates a conflict with this new belief. Therefore, it's really important. And, and it's the first thing I did with her. I had to start with changing those beliefs. So the first two sessions had nothing to do with weight loss and everything to do with just changing those two key belief systems. And what happened is that when those two belief systems changed, it wasn't just that she could then start losing weight, but it had a massive ripple effect in lots of other areas of her life as well. And if you can get to the crux of just a few key belief systems, it can have transformative powers in almost every area of someone's life, depending on what that belief is. So continuing on the topic of belief systems, there's two important principles that link to belief systems. One is called cognitive dissonance and the second is called self-efficacy. Now cognitive dissonance is basically where we um, see an element of additional value in something depending on our behavior. So there's two classic examples that demonstrate cognitive dissonance. If someone is about to place a bet then their belief on the likelihood that their outcome is going to be true is more after they place the bet than before. So their, their, the fact that they've taken action therefore influences their own belief about what's happened. Okay, that's dissonance. Um, smokers are a good example of dissonance. Um, most smokers that are intelligent know at some level that smoking is very dangerous, very detrimental to health. They know that. Therefore, to reconcile that they are an intelligent person doing something that is, let's say, unintelligent on the basis that it's detrimental for their health means that they have to have this dissonance. And the dissonance quite often is that a smoker will see additional value in the other benefits related to smoking, such as it helps them relax or it helps them to socialize or whatever it might be. The fact that Two things can't be the case. They can't be intelligent and do something stupid. Therefore, they create the dissonance in this new or, um, let's say, related area. That's cognitive dissonance. So quite often, for example, I see this in phobic clients all the time. Because they are, and, and I've worked with very confident people that have what feels like irrational fears. So therefore, the dissonant comes from them looking at those things and almost demonizing whatever the trigger is for their phobia, because it can't be about them, therefore it has to be about that thing. So they start getting angry at these animals or these situations or these triggers, okay? And that's cognitive dissonance. That can be used against someone, it could also be used for someone. Self-efficacy is a slightly different principle but still linked to belief systems. Self-efficacy is essentially, we create beliefs based on our own experiences, okay? So a lot of people believe that they believe things and therefore that's why they do things. But the opposite is also true. Sometimes people have had experiences, they do things, and therefore they believe something. So for example, let's say that you play sport, uh, a new sport that you've never played before and you're quite good at that. Then you might have the belief system that I am good at that sport. But you only believe that you're good at that sport because of the behavior that you took and the results that you've got. So self-efficacy is where we have belief systems based on our own experiences. And that's why immersive therapy and flooding is so powerful because it tackles things at the self-efficacy level and the cognitive dissonance level simultaneously. At the self-efficacy level, it works because you've had the experience of doing that thing. Now, if we use the tarantula example, if someone has arachnophobia or had arachnophobia and they hold a tarantula, therefore, that experience themselves enables them to create a new belief system. They said, well, I can't have this phobia anymore because I've held this spider and I've held this tarantula, okay? So the new belief system comes from the very experience that they've had. Cognitive dissonance 
also kicks in because now it's a case of, well, if I've done this thing, then I can easily handle this smaller thing. Okay, so self-efficacy and cognitive dissonance can work against an individual, but if it's used in the right way, it can work for an individual as well. And one of the key things that I'm constantly looking for when I'm working with clients are those opportunities to change belief systems through their own actions and their own choices. So although I could tell someone what to do, what I'm much more interested in is leading them down to a path when they make that choice themselves. Because if they make that choice, then it triggers the element of cognitive dissonance. For example, that story that I told where um, I was invited to speak on stage in front of 500 people, the fact that I said yes, even though I felt anxiety, created a new form of dissonance. Because I said yes, then I created the belief system that, well, I said yes because I must have confidence in myself that I can do it. And then when I did do that thing and I spoke in front of 500 people, then self-efficacy created a belief system, which is, well, if I've spoken in front of 500 people, I could easily speak in front of 10, 20 or 50 people. So that's how the belief systems work. Sometimes it's not just through changing thoughts inside your head. Sometimes it really is down to actual experiences. And that's the power of belief systems. That's the power of cognitive dissonance and self-efficacy. What is NLP and how can it be used to help with phobias? NLP is an abbreviation. It's, it, what is NLP and how can it be used to help with phobias? NLP stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. It was a tool, a set of methodologies created in the 1970s by Richard Bandler and John Grinder. And it's a, it started off really as a way of studying language and studying um, excellence through modeling. So back then, they studied mainly therapists and language and, and grammar to find out what patterns are people using to create change. And what they found is that people that had phobias and then didn't have phobias did certain things in a particular way. So they might have a belief, for example, that change is possible. They might have a belief that it's not just desirable to get rid of this fear, but it's an absolute must to get rid of this fear. And they would go through certain sequences. So the reason why neurolinguistic programming is so powerful is that it enables us to look at the structure of subjective thought and to manipulate those thoughts to create changes. And what we're looking for is that not everyone in the world has the same emotional reaction to the stimulus that you currently have with your phobia. And therefore, their thoughts and their dominoes in that chain reaction are different to yours. So if we change your dominoes for their dominoes, change your thoughts for their thoughts or similar thoughts that are ecological and work with your values and your belief systems, then you're going to get a similar emotional reaction and therefore you can deal with that particular situation. Also, NLP studied various different um, techniques, protocols used. Um, so very early on, um, there was a system known as the uh, rewind technique or the fast phobia cure, where um, people that had lifelong phobias would have those phobias eliminated in 15 or 20 minutes. And a lot of those techniques have been applied and refined in this course, so you're going to experience them firsthand. Um, it then evolved, and there are lots of other techniques now that deal with the shifting of subjective thought, the submodality shifts, using things like timelines and, and going into the future, the past, and, and the present, and changing how we think about certain things to get you in a very resourceful state. So when you hear me say I use NLP techniques, that refers to neuro-linguistic programming, and it's really the tools, and more important, the philosophy you know, the thought process, one of the key presuppositions of NLP is that um, the, the purpose of your communication is the response that you get. So when I'm working with clients one-on-one, -on -one, I can calibrate my language and pay attention to the verbal and nonverbal reactions from an individual. So I constantly refine my language, my words, and my, uh, my communication until I get the result of them not having that fear response anymore. It's more tricky to do that, obviously, in an online course, because I have to make my language broad enough and follow certain structures so it will be useful for pretty much whoever is watching or listening to this content. Because I've worked with approaching 300 phobics now, 
I know certain things that are consistent throughout all phobics, and that's why I'm able to create this content in an online course. But at the same time, uh, one-on-one, I tend to get the results quicker because I can just kind of um, mirror and apply to the individual rather than having such a wide variety of communication so that someone within that would benefit from what I do. So I'm a big fan of neurolinguistic programming and clinical hypnotherapy because both approaches are designed to create change within an individual that is based on the outcome that they want. What is hypnosis and how can hypnosis um, deal with a phobia? Hypnosis is a, uh, an approach, a form of communication that is really communicating with the subconscious or unconscious mind rather than with people consciously. Uh, and a lot of what you do is completely unconscious. Uh, in my video on fears and phobias, you're going to learn a lot about what hypnosis is and how hypnosis can actually eliminate a phobia. But essentially, a lot of what we do is completely unconscious. Sometimes you are paying attention to exactly what's being said, but sometimes things are just happening um, without your conscious awareness. So if you drive, for example, when you learn to drive, that was all very consciously thought out. Every behavior was a conscious decision. And now if you drive, you can drive on long journeys thinking very little about that journey and about the driving process because essentially you're doing it on autopilot. Why, where hypnotherapy can really help is that rather than trying to communicate directly with the conscious mind, I can communicate with those parts within your unconscious that probably have some positive intent about what the phobia is trying to do for you, such as protect you, for example, or to avoid distressing emotional states that make you feel horrible. Um, by communicating with those parts and by using hypnotic language patterns, we can make changes that if we didn't do it unconsciously, would take a much longer period of time. Um, hypnosis and throughout this course and over the seven days, you're gonna experience lots of different hypnosis audio downloads and videos where I use hypnosis. Just one of these may be sufficient to break through your phobia, but by having so many different types, it's almost like we're attacking the problem from so many different directions that it really just doesn't stand a chance. So you won't have your phobia for very much longer um, because we're gonna use hypnosis, we're gonna use neuro-linguistic programming, we're gonna use goal setting techniques, cogni cognitive behavioral therapy, all these different approaches so that we can really destroy your phobia once and for all. That's pretty much it. There's, there's a lot of content I've recorded here. Um, obviously this is really um, designed um, for me to then give this to um, be edited and put together where the audio is synced and there'll probably be some additional images and, and things like that. But it's designed to be structured so that people paying for and downloading the course can then just use this uh, kind of stuff um, for their own purposes. Um, thank you very much for your attention. If you've been intrigued by this and you think, well, look, I kind of get a sense of what's going on here, but it sounds like there's a lot going on. If you want to learn more about the um, seven day phobia cure or eliminating phobias in seven days, visit my website, phobiaguru.com. The web address is going to be in the description comments there. Uh, it has a money back guarantee. So even if um, you know, you try it and it doesn't work for you, you can get a full refund. The key thing is, is that I've put so much time, so much effort into doing something. And when I work one-on-one -on -one, uh, with clients, for example, um, the, it, it costs 245 pounds for a 90 minute session to give you an idea, this entire course with seven different downloads, lots of videos, hours worth of videos is all available for 99 pounds. So it's very, very cost effective and enables people to work with me that wouldn't be able to afford to work with me in any other way. I hope this has been useful. If you found it useful, please like, um, please share with someone that has a phobia that could benefit from this system and how I work, uh, and comment, tell me what your phobia is and what you've tried, because I'm gonna be looking at those comments to customize the content that I create in the future. Thank you so much for your time, it's been really appreciated, and I look forward to speaking or hearing from you in the future.